Barbara Chesky from the Chester County Foundation. Uh, the headquarters of the foundation is at the Lincoln Building on, uh, on Market Street. It's a unique organization that manages more than 400 different charitable funds in the form of family trusts, nonprofit endowments, scholarships, and field of interest funds. This permits the smaller philanthropic trusts and foundations to avoid the costly management expenses, grant uh, review processes, and other time-consuming aspects of charitable endeavors. So without any further ado, uh, Beth and Jason, the floor is yours. Sure. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And first of all, thank you so much for, for inviting us to attend the fellowship meeting this morning. It's wonderful to see everyone. Um, hopefully someday we'll be able to see you in person. But, it, you know, I, I appreciate, Dave, you're reaching out. Dave and I know each other from another committee that we work on also connected to Westminster. So uh, it is our pleasure to be here today. I thought I'd, I'd, I'd introduce myself first and ask Jason to introduce himself and then get into sort of some of the specifics around the foundation. And we do have a number of overlapping connections with Westminster, whether it's in terms of um, actual funds or whether it's in terms of members of your church who also volunteer with the Community Foundation. So as Dave noted, my name is Beth Harper Brillia. I'm currently a senior philanthropic advisor for the Chester County Community Foundation. And I've been there for uh, almost 20 years, according to LinkedIn, the official recorder of all, all times that people have been at various different organizations. Ted, as you mentioned before, I, I do have an accounting background. I'm CPA by trade, although I made the movement from the corporate world into the nonprofit sector over 25 years ago. And, uh, and it's been very, very fulfilling. I love my work with the Community Foundation. And one of the things we're gonna talk about is the way we take community in that term very seriously. But enough about me. Jason, do you wanna introduce yourself a little bit? Absolutely. Uh, everyone, thank you so much for uh, having Beth and I uh, come and speak to you. Um, I'm Jason, I'm with the Chester County Community Foundation. Uh, started relatively new back in the summer. Um, I bring uh, a number of uh, different uh, experiences uh, through my time and my career, uh, which really started over 20 years ago as well. And um, I recently came from some, an organization that you may have heard from, heard about, uh, Community Volunteers in Medicine. Uh, and I led the uh, development efforts there and fundraising efforts for a number of years. Um, and uh, the Westminster Presbyterian is was very, very generous and continues to be uh, to that organization. And uh, it's very appreciated. And prior to that, I was at Mainline Health for about uh, 10 and a half years and a number of advancement development uh, capacities. My background is more public affairs and communications. And uh, I'm originally from Scranton and uh, got my family up there, Northeast PA. Uh, and um, uh, we live in Paoli here, my wife and I, we have two uh, daughters. Uh, and we love it down here. We've been in the county since the early 2000s uh, and just think it's amazing. So the Community Foundation does a lot of great work and we're excited to talk to you a little bit about what, what we do. Excellent. Well, thanks, Jason. I'm going to share my screen. Um, this is meant to be a sort of a dialogue as well as a formal presentation. We have a time built in for questions, but if something strikes you and you want to make sure you, you hit it then, uh, please just hesitate and, and stop us. I mentioned I've already had coffee this morning. I tend to talk very quickly anyway, but um, feel free to interrupt at any point in time. Jason and I have, have different roles in the, found, in, the, uh, in the presentation, as you'll see. So uh, Dave, thank you so much for that kind information. We are the Chester County Community Foundation, just a quick overview. We manage over 415 charitable funds. Those charitable funds may have been started by individuals, families, other nonprofits. And the, the charitable fund then is able to make distribution to various different nonprofits of their choice. In the individual and family's perspective, they're recommending grants from their charitable funds to various different charities. In the nonprofit's perspective, we're generally holding an endowment fund for them and all the monies earned go back to that nonprofit. So today we were started over 27 years ago. Uh, and we are about 90 million in assets. It's actually 90 plus. I always put the 90 plus in there because as you all know, the market goes up and down and sometimes it treats us well and sometimes it doesn't treat us well. So, it's, but we're roughly of that size right now. Uh, annually, we give away about 3.2 million in grants and scholarships. Again, that's through the generosity of the individuals and families who hold the funds at the community foundation. In, eight point, in uh, 
fiscal year last year, last year we actually gave away about 8.2 million. That was due to the fact that the county entrusted us with about 3.5 million of their CARES Act funding to give to nonprofits. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we move through the presentation. But on, a, on an average year, I'll say we gave away about 3.2, 3.3 million in grants and scholarships. We are all public charities, we're nonprofits, but we're there are one of 850 community foundations across the country. And the basic difference in a community foundation is we're all separately incorporated, is that we work within a specific community to provide services to that community of a nonprofit of a nonprofit nature and to help to build charitable funds in a given community that can sustain that community forever of its nonprofits work and its philanthropy. Although in this area, there's the Philadelphia Foundation, which is our largest community foundation in this area, but each county actually has its own foundation. So Montgomery County, Delaware County, Bucks County, uh, Lancaster County, but um, we get along well together and we share information widely, but we are all separately incorporated. As a public charity, we're governed by a 25 member board of directors. These are all volunteer directors and we're operated by a staff of eight professionals. So, but our real strength and the strength of any community foundation in my perspective is that we attract a number of community volunteers. So we have about 75 plus community volunteers, some of whom are, are members of your church um, who serve on our board, who serve on our various different committees, who help us make grant decisions and we value their work immensely. Um, the, when I say we hold over 415 funds, our focus is primarily on what we'll call the endowed fund. An endowed fund is designed to last forever, and monies from that fund will be able to be gifted to charities forever. And that was the original vision of our founders. Our founders, for the most part, had their own private foundations, but they saw a need over 27 years ago to sort of bring the community together to encourage people of all means, whether high means or modest means, to start charitable funds, which would sustain nonprofits in our backyard in Chester County. As a practical matter, we can give anywhere in the United States, and sometimes we give internationally if, if, the, um, if we're able to meet the criteria that the IRS has set. So while most of our funds are endowed, we also allow for shorter term funds, which we will call quasi endowed, meaning they're not designed to last forever. And they'll have a time frame where they're paying out uh, quicker than perpetuity or provisional funds, which are more like charitable checking accounts. If you look at our assets, we have about 54% of our assets are in donor advised funds. That's an IRS term. A donor advised fund is one where the donor has set up the charitable fund and they get to advise on that fund. Um, the fund for Chester County is one that is a proprietary fund of the community foundations, but others can contribute to it. And that one is directed towards causes of importance in Chester County. And in some cases, and we're 27 years old, so we are beginning to see um, situations where an original donor may not have named a successor advisor for their fund. And so they've given us the a power to sort of give grants for their benefit forever. And those are CCCF advisor funds on this chart. 11% of our assets are nonprofit designated endowment assets. We have about 80 nonprofits that affiliate with us. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. We do scholarships. We have many, what I will call your traditional high school into college scholarships, but we also do a few that are not traditional scholarships, like scholarships for women returning to school. We do scholarships for, for an individual that's studying in the auto, automotive field. So while most of them are traditional scholarships, not all of them are. And then we have general funds, which are really directed towards a field of interest, whether it's the environment, whether it's arts and culture, whether it's health or human services. So that's a little bit about the community foundation. When I put this presentation together, I thought I would structure it um, along the lines of our strategic plan. And I will not go into great detail about our strategic plan, but I thought the graphic makes sense in terms of kind of providing in a summary of, of who we are and what we do. So the Community Foundation, while it, while it has as its primary focus to grow philanthropy and to provide excellent service while we grow that philanthropy, also works very significantly with the nonprofit community. And as we go through this presentation, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But we provide training to the nonprofit community. We hold endowment assets for the nonprofit community. We convene the nonprofit community amongst uh, around certain various issues that might be emerging, such as the pandemic or such as Hurricane Ida or, or other things of, of important note. And we involve ourselves in community issues. One of the reasons why, why we were entrusted with the CARES Act funding from the commissioners was that over the past 20 some years, we've been spending time working with the community and with all partners in the community 
on key and critical issues. And that was one of them. And all towards an eye of our institutional sustainability. So we have eight staff, our budget runs about a million dollars. We have about 90 million in assets. And so it's a little bit of what I'll say, a look at our overarching strategic goals. As we go through now, I'm gonna ask Jason to talk a little bit about what it means on a more specific level, level to grow philanthropy and how we provide fund services and fund, fund services to our advisors. Jason. Yeah, thanks Beth, I appreciate that. And, and, and so uh, the two tenants here that are very important for strategic plan are grow philanthropy and fund advisor and donor services. I wanna take a little moment to talk to you about both because they're, they're very important. It's really the hallmarks of our organization. Um, when we say grow philanthropy, um, we mean serving as spokespersons, uh, our board, uh, our team uh, in, at the foundation. Um, we serve as information uh, for resources based on giving and tithing and charitable giving. Uh, we, we work with uh, folks in the community to, to really educate and inspire. Um, we convene meetings uh, to talk about philanthropy and giving. Um, and we cultivate more of an in industry term or uh, if you will, but you know, that's more so you know, talking to people about what their plans are for the future and it's, it's cultivation uh, and engaging people in the community as Beth said, and I was gonna mention this too, Beth, you spot on um, an example of that is working with Chester County for the years that we've been in existence and them entrusting to us the CARES Act money for us to hold uh, to then award out to the nonprofits last year uh, during the pandemic and the shutdown. Um, so it's really to deepen our understanding and passion for philanthropy. As we all know, uh, philanthropy is rooted in the Greek words of love, uh, brotherly love, um, and that's what we aspire to do. Um, donors and prospects are industry term, but those are our fund advisors. Over 400 funds are with the Community Foundation each person or people, group of people who've created those funds, each one is different. They all have different reasons why they start them. Uh, I've learned that early on in working with a number of folks about why they wanna um, start a donor advised fund and give back to the community. A gentleman had mentioned uh, from Oxford, people helping people. Uh, it was very organic and very heartfelt when he said that. Uh, and I thought that was a, a spot on type of uh, mentioned in terms of why he wanted to start a donor advised fund. The other hallmark here is, uh, oh, uh, one Sorry. sec, that the, the, oh, no worries, the fund advisor and donor services. This is our team working with over 400 people in our community, either in the county or in the region, uh, to, uh, to work with them on their funds, what their fund balance is, what was their grants last year, who are the organizations that they supported what are some organizations in Chester County and the region that are doing great work? Who are they? Um, we're, we're just an email, phone call, or a text away. Uh, and that's really the, uh, one of the main hallmarks of the Community Foundation is that you get to talk to real people who have some expert knowledge about what's going on in the community. Uh, so I want to focus a little bit of the presentation on uh, legacy gifts and, and what that means uh, for you as well as for the community and the community foundation. Um, we, as I mentioned, educate people in the community and nonprofit organizations about different types of charitable giving vehicles, uh, donor advised funds, um, where you get that immediate tax break uh, when you, you start a fund uh, and then award out the grants to deserving nonprofits, um, including the organization in a bequest in your will or a gift of your home, your property, gift of property, to a nonprofit, all doable, a gift of your IRA, someone's IRA, a beneficiary of our IRA, uh, another charitable giving vehicle uh, other than what is considered cash or even a stock. If you own stock, you can certainly um, make that gift to an, a nonprofit. Um, customized giving approaches, as I mentioned, we can work with folks in the community on those types of giving opportunities. Um, and, you know, creating personal legacies. You know, the question I always like to ask people is, what do you want to leave behind uh, when, when you pass away? Or what do you want to be remembered for? Um, another thing, another question I thought was so great was if your family had a coat of arms, what does that coat of arms look like? What is it? What is the motto of that coat of arms? Um, 
helping people understand that the legacy that you have, you want to pass on to others, your family, and then causes that perhaps you care about the most. Um, and then we share community issues and needs of what's going on in the community at large uh, and provide grant making experience, expertise uh, to the community and, and um, you know, fund advisors. So it's really, this phrase here is what we use a lot, but it's connecting people who care with causes that matter. So legacy makes a difference now and forever. And I think that's pretty powerful um, when you think about where you wanna be and where your legacy goes uh, after we all pass. Uh, it's always a tough question to start, but I think people understand it. Uh, and I think we understand it over this past year and a half, two years with this pandemic that we've all been living through. Um, people have started to think about that um, and, and where their legacies uh, might go and what they wanna support. So um, this one's interesting. Why a donor advice fund? We get this question all the time. Um, as I mentioned, it's one of the easiest tax advantage ways to organize your giving. So you bundle this into a donor advised fund, uh, could support a cause that, that matters to you or multiple causes. Um, a donor advised fund is started at $25,000 and can grow above that. Um, we have three types of donor advised funds, an endowed donor advised fund, a quasi uh, in, uh, donor advised fund, and a provisional donor advised fund. The endowed fund really quickly is that you put that balance into that fund, you award out at the end of the year, 5%. Uh, they, um, it's invested in the market. Uh, we have a chief investment officer organization called Hurdle Callahan, who uh, makes invests those monies into the market, uh, the global market. Uh, seen a lot of growth over the past year. Uh, the stock market strangely has been doing well during this pandemic. So people are very happy, or donors are very happy about that. Um, the second one I mentioned, the quasi, you could award out 20% of the grant balance, uh, of that fund balance, uh, but uh, it's not as heavily invested into the market uh, as say the endowed fund. And the provisional fund is basically that charitable checking account. You put X amount of dollars into that fund. Uh, it's not invested in the market. It just kind of stays there. But, uh, you know, people, uh, do different things with it. They award grants immediately. They have fundraising events where the net proceeds of a golf outing or a gala come into that fund. And then they award out those, those monies right away uh, to charities that they care about. Um, so those are the three um, that, that we offer to, to folks in the community. You can contribute a cash gift, uh, check uh, or stock, as I mentioned. Uh, to the donor advised fund, they, you know, we were busy back at the end of December because that's tax year end uh, for everyone. And um, you know, there's you know tax uh, that's applied to a stock if you you don't sell it right away. Um, so uh, the, the the next best uh, thing to do, the best idea there is to um, you know really uh, award it out to a nonprofit or create a donor advised fund. Uh, then you don't get taxed. Um, so grants to charitable organizations of your choice can be made over time uh, when you start that fund. Um, donor advice fund can be established during your lifetime. You can start one and then say, you know what, community, Chester County Community Foundation, I want this to be a testamentary fund. I want the Community Foundation to uh, have it when I pass on. Or you could start the fund now. Um, and then include it in your estate plan. So you have the benefit of both living while seeing the good that it's doing, or you can actually, you know, and, and you can actually have that testamentary fund started and created and awarded out grants when you pass on. Um, so it's up to you. It's up to folks in the community what they want to do. I've seen both. Um, and it's, you know, it's up to the, the personal preference there. Donor advice funds are often used to encourage multi-generational giving. Um, that's huge. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing that a lot of folks are passing on their assets and their wealth to the next generation of, of family members. Um, we uh, convene family meetings. We talk to next generation uh, about philanthropy. Of course, they all have different ideas about giving uh, than, say, the previous generation. Um, our, uh, our stipulations with our, our agreements, we allow unlimited successor advisors. And that's just a fancy term for 
if you're not able to make those decisions or if you pass on, who will be guiding your fund? And that's a successor advisor. Is it your daughter or your son, your niece, your nephew, um, your cousins? Uh, who are they that would want to steer this type of fund when you're gone uh, to keep that in the family, keep that vision alive uh, to help people? It's giving, it's helping people uh, and, and, and giving back to others. That's what it's, it's really about. Um, so next slide, Beth. And this is basically what we offer, our services. Um, this is... This is what we get paid the big bucks for, okay? And um, uh, you know, we 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 basically do philanthropic planning, as I mentioned, uh, with not only uh, our fund advisors but uh, family, uh, their family members, grant making services. We convene grant panels, uh, folks in the community to come and make grant decisions uh, based from funds. You know, Beth talked about earlier. There's about eleven percent of our funds, our portfolio, if you will. Uh, are managed basically where uh, we make those decisions on behalf of the fund advisors uh, because there's no, no success for advisors or anyone to make those decisions. Um, we do due diligence. This is something of a role of the community foundation where we make sure that the nonprofit that you want to support is still got their 501c3s in good standing with the IRS um, and you know really is a legitimate nonprofit. And what kind of work are they doing? What are you investing in? And that's our, our, our job is to make sure that the nonprofits um, understand uh, that you know, we're, our role is to make sure that those nonprofits are, are doing good in the community and that you're investing in something worthwhile. Um, you know, legacy services, this is something that we also offer. We also offer to our nonprofit partners. We manage about 80 endowments uh, from nonprofits in Chester County. Um, and one of them being Westminster. Um, and we, we offer uh, legacy planning um, for nonprofits. It's starting a legacy program, a plan giving program for those organizations. Um, and, and really individually, it's talking to people about how do you wanna be remembered? And remember that coat of arms, you know, what does your coat of arms, your family coat of arms look like? And what's the motto? Uh, I think that's pretty important, um, but you know, planning for the future. Um, so Beth, uh, think, yes, okay, good. Okay, so this is the breakdown of the funds. Um, you know, we, we talked about this on the first slide, uh, but 54% of those are the prime donor advised funds, people who've made uh, contributions, significant contributions to start the fund for various reasons. Uh, the 24% is next, Chester County Community Foundation. Uh, those are the ones that are um, uh, the community foundation is, is basically making grants uh, based on those original fund advisors' decisions. So we're convening grant panels from people in the community uh, to ward out those grants and scholarships. Scholarships are next at 8%. Um, nonprofit organizations, 11%. And then, of course, you see the field of interest funds at 3%. Uh, and those are real people there, um, families, uh, people in the community, uh, generational giving. Uh, these are all pictures of real people who have funds with the Community Foundation uh, for various reasons. I think all those pictures tell a different story, uh, times that by, you know, what, 400 uh, funds. Um, you know, people are, we're, we live in a, we're very fortunate to live in a very, uh, uh, very um, philanthropic minded uh, region. I, I really do. I, I really can say that wholeheartedly, not being a transplant from, from Scranton or uh, elsewhere, sort of. Several of you can agree. Um, grants and scholarships, 791 grants and 222 scholarships last year at $8.2 million. That total $8.2 million is a little bit misleading. Uh, on average, we give out about 3.2 million in grants and scholarships, but because of the CARES Act funding that we received last year, it's 8.2 million. Um, so we've given out $48 million since 1994. Uh, which is really incredible if you think about it. Um, and here's the breakdown of those this past year, uh, the grants and scholarships uh, in terms of where they went, where did the monies go? Um, you'll see there that big chunk is human services. Uh, and that's interesting because you'll see every once in a while headlines uh, in Vista or, or other uh, news uh, publications that say Chester County is the healthiest and wealthiest in the county. But then when you look at this wheel here, this pie chart, 
that shows that 39% of grants and scholarships of $3.2 million technically went, goes to human services and health. It's interesting. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, underserved populations in our county, uh, of folks that need our help. Um, you'll see here also, uh, you know, education, you know, education grants and scholarships, 19%. Arts and culture, we really focused this year on the arts and culture community. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, last year, uh, the arts and culture organizations, the nonprofit organizations in our county, they got hit. Um, everything shut down, um, couldn't have performances, couldn't have live theater. People had to shift and had to do Zoom performances and, and bring their, their members back. And some people didn't come back uh, until very recently. So those nonprofits really needed some support. Um, so uh, we focused on really kind of convening arts and cultural groups to the Community Foundation. Uh, we created the Chester County uh, Cultural Alliance, uh, which is now uh, based in the uh, Lincoln Tea Room, the historic Lincoln, now it's called the Lincoln Room. Uh, but basically that group is now uh, responsible for, you know, working with our arts and culture organizations in the county. We've never really had one, quite frankly. Uh, the Philadelphia has a cultural alliance and they're working with us to create this thing. Um, but it's, it's a new venture for us to kind of convene these types of important topics and that arts and culture is one of them. Um, so those, that's basically the, the, the breakdown of the great grants and scholarships. Where are those monies going to? Um, again, real people in those photos. And now I'm gonna turn it over to, first, before I turn it over to Beth, I wanted to see if, if anyone has any questions, I know I've been going on and I've been hitting you hard with all this information, but uh, do you have any questions right now about you know, the gist of what I've uh, provided? No, okay. Okay. Okay, that's good, all right. I guess we're thanks, doing good thanks, so far. <laughs> all right, Beth, Thank you. Ahead. So um, Jason described in great detail our, our individual and family fund advisor services and what we do for the families. Our other focus is really on the nonprofit community. And I'll be honest with you, I was on Westminster Press's uh, website. You have an impressive list of nonprofits in this community that you do work with. And I know that your work is not only what I'm gonna call direct service, which is sort of helping with the food shelters or food banks, or, or of that nature, but also volunteering. Many of your members serve on boards of directors or advisory committees or, or other means of, of volunteerism. So work with the nonprofit community is also, as I mentioned earlier, a key component of what we do at the Community Foundation. We feel we have a responsibility to the Chester County nonprofits. There are over 800 nonprofits in the Chester County region. We generally think there's about 420 or so that are what I will call active, meaning that they're actively doing work on a daily basis and employing their mission and, and providing services to the residents of Chester County. As I mentioned earlier, we actually can gift anywhere in the United States, but as a primary focus, our focus is on Chester County and making sure that our nonprofits are strong and are strong to be able to deliver their mission and who they'd like to be. And in order to do that, we help them to do what we call build capacity. Capacity in my world means that you are strengthening the infrastructure of a nonprofit so that they can best accomplish their work. And that capacity might be built through training and education. It might be built by providing grants. It might be providing them an opportunity to have what I will call peer sharing with, with others that might be executive directors or development directors so that they can share their knowledge. And so as a whole, we might be, be stronger. We have a number of different phones that focus on different items to help our nonprofits become stronger, to have a different, uh, very strong impact in terms of who they are. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, first of all, what do we do is we, we annually, and hopefully some of you have, have known about this or have been able to attend it, we host an annual board trustees institute for nonprofit boards of directors. So we try to encourage growth in the educational capacity of those who are volunteering their time to serve on nonprofit boards. So annually we host this, this event. It generally takes place in the fall. When it's in person, it takes place at Westchester University. When it's not in person, we've done it on Zoom. And I believe there actually may be some pre-recorded sessions that you can actually access by looking at our website. But in general, we hope to we help to build the capacity of the individual who's volunteering their time by teaching them, educating them, informing them about non, what is their role as a nonprofit board member. What are some of the fiduciary and legal obligations they might have as a nonprofit board member? 
What is their role in strategic planning? A role of the board member in general is to do uh, planning for an organization. It's to make sure that the, that organization has the financial resources to accomplish their missions. And that all becomes part of what we help to educate um, our trustees on, our volunteer trustees in the community on the finances and fundraising and development. This last two years have been really um, a roller coaster in many ways, one thing after another it was the pandemic and then it was a lot of focus on social equity issues. And during that time, the role of a community foundation was really to convene, to convene our neighbors, our friends, our colleagues around issues that are of importance to them. And so we convened around issues which address the pandemic. How does, a, how does a nonprofit respond to the pandemic? If they're, in, for instance, a nonprofit that's, that was in a food shelter or housing business, they probably saw an inundation or an increase, sorry, that wasn't even a word, an increase in the number of donations that they received related to services they, they were providing. But how do they deal with that influx? We dealt with that. On the other hand, if you were an arts and culture organization, as Jason mentioned, you may not have had a lot of donations. So how do you deal with, with a significant drop or a decline in your donations? So we hosted sessions around those types of top, topics to help our nonprofits respond appropriately to that. I mentioned earlier social equity issues. In fact, I think it's today, actually, we have, a, we have a, what we call our food for thought sessions. Our food for thought sessions is really just anyone from across the community can attend, or we'll talk about a particular issue. And today's issue, I believe, is in social equity. But we, we also hosted um, discussions around other topics as well, and current topics impacting nonprofits. As Jason mentioned earlier, we, we do grants management and distribution, both from those funds that our individuals and families hold, as well as the, the funds that the Community Foundation holds on behalf of donors who are no longer with us. And our particular focus on nonprofits, again, going back to our founders and what their vision was, was to ensure that the nonprofits, they would be able to be sustained themselves forever by the growth of their own endowment funds. So as Jason mentioned, we hold 80 nonprofit endowment funds. Now, one of those is a small nonprofit fund that, that is a portion of Westminster Press has a small nonprofit endowment fund. The bulk of your endowment funds are not held at the community foundation, but we do have a, a small one. But why an endowment fund? Some people ask us, why would a nonprofit even need an endowment? Well, I think the pandemic really showed us why a nonprofit needs an, an endowment. One, financial stability. An endowment provides an external source of income to a nonprofit that is not beholden to a grant maker's desire to either give you money or not give you money, a donor's desire to give you money or not give you money. For them, it helps to provide a sustainable source of revenue. And so stability, growth, your endowment can be used to grow funds over time, either through the investments in markets or by growing additional gifts associated with that, non with that endowment fund. And they are intended to be permanent. And it's funny, somebody asked me the other day, they said, why should a nonprofit have an endowment? Or if a nonprofit does have an endowment, why do they need my money? Well, it's an investment. I think the way that many of us now look at our gifts to our charities that we support, are we're making an investment in that charity because we believe in the mission of that charity. And an endowment fund says that the internal organization of that charity also believes that they're an important and they're creating a method to sustain themselves forever from a financial perspective. So to that end, for the nonprofits for whom we hold endowments, and again, most of them are small to medium sized because we help them invest, the uh, nonprofits who are small to medium sized actually participate in the investment markets. It's hard. If you have an endowment fund, let's say 100,000 versus somebody who has an endowment fund of 90 million, they're gonna be able to attract a lot better rates uh, for their fees provided by investment managers as well as sometimes even rates of return. And so we help our nonprofits participate in that market uh, by investing their money, obviously accounting for their money and being compliant with any applicable rules and regulations. But the real reason we do it is because we believe that nonprofits, we can help with their capacity to help attract planned or legacy gifts. And we do that by helping them develop promotional materials. We help to educate them on development strategies that might work for them to sort of build their, their financial capacity the Board of Trustees Institute that I mentioned earlier and other nonprofit sessions. We provide coaching and consulting to our nonprofits. And by the way, this applies to anything. If you have any question related to a nonprofit and you don't know where to turn, don't hesitate to call us. We often serve as an information and referral source for any question, whether you have a fund at the foundation or have any connection to the foundation, we're always there to help out. 
And so I want to, but we do that for our nonprofits on a regular basis. You know, we help to, to review their materials that they might want to post online about a giving strategy. We help to connect them to tax advisors if they have a particular question about a, a, a tax strategy. We help to, to connect them if they are, have been approached and someone wants to leave them an asset that they don't know quite how to accept. So let's say you're a small nonprofit and someone says to them, I'm going to give you a house. And you're like, wow, great idea. I don't know how to accept a house. We get those calls. How do I deal with that? Somebody wants to give me a house. I don't know how to deal with that. And so we actually work ourselves with partners to help us do that kind of thing. So I know many of you work with other nonprofits. So I want to keep, keep our work in mind for you when you deal with those nonprofits and questions might come up that they might have regarding how uh, the Community Foundation can work with them and help them. I mentioned earlier, if we're looking, if we go back to the graphic that we showed earlier, we've talked about um, we've talked about funds, individual donor funds, family funds. We've talked about nonprofits and the work we do with nonprofits. But one of our needs, as one of our priorities, is community needs and addressing those community needs and being sure that we're part of the on a county level, the organizations that work to address those. So this is a, just a small list of some of the, or, of the uh, I would say the county-based groups that are convened to address particular issues. We might lead, we might partner, we might facilitate these meetings, we might just take action at them, we might help to research for them. I mentioned earlier the CARES Act funding that we took in. We did a survey of our nonprofits to see what impact the pandemic might have on them. And the number that we arrived at was so that they might show overall a decline of 3.5 million across all nonprofits in Chester County. I think unfortunately that number has probably been higher than that, but early on that was our best guess. And so that's the research we did for the commissioners helped us to prior, helped us to obtain that funding. But we, we participate on the Committee to Prevent Homelessness, the Chester County Committee to Prevent Homelessness. One of your church members also participates on that committee, Bert Rothenberg. Um, we participate very actively on uh, when, the, when the pandemic hit, Chester County put together a committee called the Restore Chester County Committee, comprised of business professionals, uh, nonprofit professionals and others relevant to the discussion at hand. And we participate on that committee. Jason described earlier our work on the Arts and Culture Coalition. Uh, we convene periodically other funders in the county. So others who can provide dollars to our nonprofits, we convene them so that we can best help to uh, collaborate on funding initiatives. Uh, the Federal Reserve of Philadelphia selected the Community Foundation to help them to facilitate a project that they were doing on small business and equity and in those small businesses. Um, and we did that with the Chester County Economic Development Council. Uh, right now, as some of you are probably aware, or most of you are aware in general, we face uh, two Chester County hospital closures, the Brandywine Hospital, as well as the Jennersville Hospital one of which is closed, one of which will close imminently. And so there's been an alliance put together, primarily facilitated by the Health Equity Alliance, which is formerly the Brandywine Health Foundation. But we participate in that as well in terms of hospital closures and how can our most vulnerable residents in Chester County um, help to address some of the, the issues that may emerge from those hospital closures. And last but certainly not least, uh, there is a longstanding committee called the Long-Term Recovery Committee, which is Chester County-based which helps to uh, address Hurricane Ida issues and other regional issues of a disaster nature that might um, pop up. So we see ourselves in taking that community in our name very seriously. Um, and this is the type of thing that we do of our time. Um, I won't belabor this point, but that's just a slide which talks about the 3.5 million allocated from the CARES Act funding. And it went, as you will see, it went across all different types of categories, anything from arts and culture, education, environment, health, religion, even religious-based human, human service providers receive some money from that. So, so we have a lot of intersections here at Westminster. Um, one, we actually hold the New Beginnings Attainable Housing Fund. New Beginnings Attainable Housing Fund was started by Westminster to help you to address uh, some of the, I think the strategic priorities that emerged from your last planning planning uh, exercise at the church. Uh, the Attainable Housing Fund is actually raising monies to help spur investment in attainable housing projects. So that uh, one of the most significant issues that we face as a county today is access to affordable housing. And um, this fund was designed to help uh, provide dollars to nonprofits who participate in that space of helping our residents find affordable housing. 
Uh, we actually hold a small, as I mentioned earlier, Westminster Presbyterian Endowment Fund. Uh, we have uh, some donors that are what we'll call charitable gift annuity donors. Not to get into too many details, but a charitable gift annuity is a gift uh, where you participate and receive money on a periodic basis and the nonprofit participates and receives money on a periodic basis. And we did that on behalf of Westminster for one of your, your key members. Several of your members have individual and family donor advised funds and we're happy to, to work with them. Um, we have several of your members participate on our board and on its committees. Uh, we have borrowed the, the financial expertise of several of your mem members to help us in our finance committee. Um, but we also welcome you, if, if anything we've said today has sort of struck a chord where you say, you know what, I'd like to volunteer with that organization. The easiest way to get involved with the Community Foundation is to volunteer for one of our grant panels. And our grant panels generally consist of between three to five persons. It is a sort of a, a one shot, if you'd like it to be a one shot where you participate for one grant panel. You can certainly participate on multiple ones, but because I know we're all time limited, some people might only have time for one. Stephanie Stevens, who's one of our, our um, staff members, directs our community outreach and our grants management program. And we would then, you would send either Jason or I an email saying, hey, that sounds interesting, I'd like to participate. And our emails are on this presentation, which by the way, Ted, we will send you after this um, and volunteer. You know, they're a lot of fun. And on a grants panel, what typically happens is you might, uh, let's say you're an environmental grants panel, you might get five applications from, from grantees, from nonprofits who are seeking money in the environmental world to do something of, of value. And then you help to decide the monies that we have at the Community Foundation, where it goes, and you debate the relative merits of giving it to one project versus another, and you might look at the finances of the organizations. We provide you with a lot of background information, but I think what people find most fun about those committees is really the dialogue that takes place uh, with them. So that's a little bit uh, about how you can work further with us. There's already opportunities in place, but you can, and I guess Dave, you work with on the Attainable Housing Fund as well. So, um, so yeah, so there's a lot of opportunities to get involved. So I'm gonna pause here for a second. I'm just gonna stop share before we get into other issues to see whether anybody has any, any questions, observations, things that you wanna take note of what we might've said. Beth, I have a question for you. Sure. It's really one of, uh, there's probably a simple answer, but I, and I may know it, but how does the charitable foundations that your organization is overseeing or managing, how do those differ from what the large investment houses do like Fidelity and Vanguard? Yeah, that's a great question, Ted. And in fact, Vanguard's in our backyard as well. We count them as a competitor, they're also a peer. So we actually, I, I actually interface with several Vanguard executives. So the basic difference between a commercial donor advised fund and a community foundation donor advised fund is that we, we um, operate on a community-based level as opposed to a national level. And so we are able to provide philanthropic services related to that community focus. So let's say that you have a Vanguard or Fidelity, which are some of the big ones, donor advised fund. They certainly are great because they, I always like to say a rising tide floats all boats. So philanthropic dollars are philanthropic dollars. But let's say you would want to have more information about a particular nonprofit. Maybe you'd like to visit that nonprofit. Maybe you'd like to discuss some of the financial situations behind that nonprofit. Maybe you'd like to engage with that nonprofit. A community foundation typically excels at that connection, at that connection to that specific nonprofit. So while we welcome the commercial donor advised funds, we are different ultimately in terms of the level of service that we provide to donors at any level. One of our favorite sayings is you too can be a philanthropist. The services that we provide um, are the same, whether you are one of our, 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 our smaller donors in terms of the financial asset or whether you're one of our larger donors as well. So does that help? Yeah. Yeah, Dave. Um, Beth, in the next year or two, I may have to be involved in a in forming a 501c3 that would have a specific purpose of acquiring and interpreting a historical site. And let's, let's say the amount of money needed to be raised was 150,000. Is that the kind of fund that uh, the community foundation would be interested in or 
or not? And if it was, uh, how do you get paid? Is it a, uh, a fee off, uh, off the top of the net assets or, or what? No, that's a great question, Dave. Thank you. So um, if you're looking to form a nonprofit and then raise monies from others in order to implement the mission of that nonprofit, in this case, historic preservation, we can help to point you in direction of how you might start the nonprofit, but we typically don't hold the nonprofit's assets. Um, in, in our case, we hold assets that you might want to attract as that nonprofit. And so we would encourage you to go through a grant application process in order to raise money from our donors for that nonprofit. But we can certainly provide you some guidance in terms of, you know, maybe you're looking for someone to help you incorporate, maybe you're looking to uh, what's needed to incorporate, uh, and those kinds of things. What I'm, oh. I'm worried about is, uh, you know, let's say it's five people start this. And they're relatively unknown. And uh, you know, a bank wants to give fifty thousand dollars if they know it is going through the Chester County uh, Community Foundation. They'd be less reluctant than to send it off to five guys with a new uh, startup five hundred one c three. So, how can you overcome those kind of reluctance and due diligence on the part of the givers? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question because you're right. A lot of times we, uh, for lack of a better word, I'm going to say we, we've served as the housekeeping good certificate of approval um, for nonprofits that are startups because we do take a risk on nonprofits that are startup and we might be able to provide them with some capacity building funding, which then leaves that nonprofit in a better position to go ask others for money. So um, it's, it's a tough position that all new nonprofits face in terms of, of justifying who they are and their worth. Um, we have oftentimes served to, as an advocate, and I know we do that for the New Beginnings Attainable Housing Fund. We serve as an advocate for that group, given what their mission is. Um, but we will not hold a new, like we will not serve in place of a nonprofit structure. The IRS doesn't like us to do that. They have their own form and process for that. But, you know, we, we do encourage a new nonprofit to kind of work with us on a close basis so that they're, they inform us of who they are, what they're doing, so that when you have, and in your example, you, you have that bank say, hey, have you ever heard of XYZ? We can say, yes, we have heard of XYZ, and this is who's behind them. This is what they're trying to do, and this is why it may make sense for you to give to them. Yeah. Oh, in terms of how we make our money, that's a great question, too. So uh, for our individual and family donor advised funds, as well as our nonprofit funds, the Community Foundation charges 1% um, of the accumulated value of the fund per year for our services. I kind of laugh there because, you know, many years ago, that 1%, if you go to most community foundations, you'll say it's 1%. Somebody came up with that business model. It doesn't quite work. And again, I'm an accountant by trade. So I look at sustainability and things like that. But in general, it's 1% of the asset in the fund is how we, we, are, we charge for our services. And of course, that's not a separate invoice. It's taken out of the net value of the fund. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Because I just wanted to touch on a couple issues before we wrap up here that you might be, be uh, you know, as you look at philanthropic issues in the world and some of the things that are, that are occupying our attention right now. Okay. So hopefully everybody can see that. So it's an interesting time to be in philanthropy, no doubt. Um, I think Jason, I split this where I'm taking the first couple ones, right? Okay. So Undoubtedly, the impact of COVID-19 and the pandemic will be studied for years. Back when it was 2020, I used to like to say hindsight is 2020, because we will look at the pandemic and how we responded, and you'll probably be able to get a master's degree or even a doctorate degree in pandemic studies in COVID-19. Um, we, we, we reacted very quickly, as you all know, not only we as a community foundation, but we as a society reacted very quickly. And we're still feeling the impact of, of COVID-19, the pandemic on our nonprofits. And so we work closely with them on that. Shortly on the heels of the pandemic came our focus on social justice and equity issues. Interesting time to be in nonprofits. I think some of the things that we found was that maybe we are not as attentive to our um, equity issues when we are doing funding, not so much the community foundation, but the philanthropic sector in total. And so there's there's been a, a movement, uh, a good movement, I think, to sort of have more equitable funding. I think most of us would agree that the pandemic has hit different sectors of our society differently. 
And I think this became apparent when we, we started talking about social justice and equity issues. A, a trend that I'd like in the nonprofit world is that philanthropies and those who have money to give are tending to do what I'm gonna call more trust-based philanthropy, which meaning that uh, when someone applies for a grant, you know, there used to be a high level of detail requested from our nonprofits for applying for a grant. And now it's a less level of detail because a lot of that detail can be found out from publicly available sources. And there's more trust in who the organization is that's requesting the money and what they're going to, doing, going to do with the money and more engagement and dialogue as opposed to engagement of paperwork. Those of you who are involved in the grant writing business would certainly um, agree with that. We have seen an, a greater emphasis on cooperation and collaboration. You know, if you look at the county, and I mentioned earlier on that there's about 800 nonprofits in Chester County and about 400 plus are active in there. The primary funding partner in the county uh, are two. One is the, uh, the government. The county government by far gives more dollars to our nonprofit than any individual or family source. But yet the individual and family donors, and, and I don't know whether anyone saw this, but recently Chester County was voted the number one county I know we all are number one county in health and wellness and things like that, but we're number one county also for philanthropic endeavors, meaning that over 15% of our Chester County residents participate in philanthropic activities, whether it's giving of your time and talent in terms of volunteering or whether it's in terms of giving your philanthropic resources. So there's been more of an emphasis on what I'm going to call cooperation and collaboration, as well as public and private partnerships to move situations forward. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, I serve on the housing committee, the Chester County Housing Committee to prevent homelessness, a lot of public private partnerships with respect to that committee and others. Uh, so, so these are some things that it's an interesting time to be engaged in philanthropy and some interesting ideas that we keep, uh, issues that we keep our eyes on. And Jason's going to talk a little bit about uh, the other issues here. Yeah, so, you know, as you see there, there's an increase in social impact investing. And, and what is that? Um, I think everyone can agree these, you know, this past two years, three years, there's been a lot of impactful events that have affected us in our country and as a society as a whole within the, you know, the two years since COVID originated. Um, you know, all of these major societal events have pushed nonprofits donors like ourselves and, and, and even Chester County Community Foundation fund advisors to rethink how their funds are being re or invested. And what do you mean by that, Jason? Well, reflecting on, you know, these folks reflect on who they are uh, and their beliefs. I mentioned that earlier, that there's a lot of folks rethinking in, in terms of their planning and their beliefs uh, based on what's happened over the past year or two years because of COVID. Um, you know, there's a lot of news out there about uh, the true science behind climate change and media outlets pushing this and nonprofit organizations looking at their finances and funds. So also in light of the George Floyd uh, murder and those protests that occurred, um, good governance and diversity, equity, inclusion have all you know, really uh, uh, become at the forefront. Um, and it's being looked at even more by our nonprofits and, and board members in the county and elsewhere uh, across really the country. Case in point, um, investors are looking at, um, and, and even nonprofits are looking at the way they invest their funds, um, what's called ESG, and um, you know, environmental, social, and governance, ESG. Uh, those are uh, really the funds. How are those funds being invested in the market, the stock market? Are they being invested in, say, fossil fuels? Uh, in, in uh, say, for example, uh, guns. And this this sounds very striking to us, but you know this is being taken a look at, and a lot of people, a lot of organizations, are kind of saying, look, we don't want to invest in fossil fuels. Um, they want to look at uh, different ways, fossil-free fuels. What are those investments? Um, how do we not invest in, in organizations or companies that make guns or firearms? Uh, it's being talked about. Um, and, you know, ESG is, is something that, you know, people are asking about. Even the next generation of, of uh, uh, fund advisors, uh, even third generation, second and third generation families are asking about it. So it's out there. In fact, you know, Harvard University, we can send you this article uh, just a couple months ago, shared that they're restructuring in terms of how they're investing in their funds uh, to be 
uh, ESG minded, uh, fossil free. Uh, they're pulling away from that. That's huge uh, when you think about an institution like, like Harvard. Um, you know, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is there's a great, huge American transfer of wealth that's occurring. You know, I think over the next two, 20 years, two decades, um, you know, baby boomers are transferring, you know, people born between 19, 1944 and 1964 are transferring about $30 trillion in wealth to younger generations. It's called the great wealth transfer. Uh, but this is a, another topic that's, that's constantly daily. We see it uh, in the publications that we follow. Um, in no time in America has, this, has really this ever happened, this vast amount of wealth that's transferred from one hand to another uh, with families. So the peak is still several years away, um, but you know, I, I think you know, baby boomers are, are thinking 15, 20 years away from driving increases in gifts um, upon their passing. Uh, it's an interesting statistic. Oldest boomers, baby boomers are 76 years old. What does that mean for them? You know, studies have shown that 83% of charitable bequest dollars come from those who pass away over age 80. And uh, it goes down slightly when uh, 70% uh, when, for those who live to age 85 and older. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of wealth and a lot of assets being transferred. And what does that me mean for the nonprofit community? What does it mean for the Community Foundation um, Network. And what does that mean for us? Uh, what does that mean for us as, as our, being our own philanthropic minded people and our families? You know, it really is a, is a tier when you think about how much wealth is being transferred uh, over these next 20 years. It's gonna be something. Um, and it's exciting to, to see that um, from, a, from an industry perspective. Uh, don't you agree, Beth? I mean, that really is, um, it's huge. Yeah. It, it, it is huge, and um, there's some tax strategies which, which favor that form of charitable giving and, and yeah. things to consider when you're looking at your estate plan and other things. Some gifts are more, benef more beneficial to give to a charity than they might be to an heir. So this is all an area that we get involved in the community foundation that we deal with. And I, I think, as Jason might have mentioned earlier, you know, um, one of our hallmarks is that everyone can be a philanthropist. And that's really what, what I have always loved and enjoyed about the Community Foundation is sort of this uh, participation that everyone can participate in some way. And to us, again, philanthropy is giving not only financial wealth, but also time and talent. And so, um, you know, I wanna thank you all for having us join today. Uh, it's been a pleasure to see each of you, if not meet each of you in person. And I certainly would encourage you, I'm gonna send the slides out to Dave and Ted after this and they can forward it onto the group. If I have all your emails, which I may actually had all of them on the last email, you'll all be included, but if not, they'll forward it onto. But I wanna, well, thank you first of all, for, for how much you all engage in the community. Oh, yeah. This is a very active congregation and we know that your, your engagement in the community is, is astounding. Um, I've had the pleasure of dealing with many of your members on various different committees, and, and we appreciate what you give back in the way of time, talent, and treasure as well. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Is there any other questions for Beth and Jason? Uh, seeing none, Craig, do you want to mention who's the speaker next week? You're muted. Craig, you need to unmute. There you go. Okay. Sheldon Dean is going to talk to us about uh, uh, Bach, his life. Uh, Sheldon's been very active uh, with uh, the uh, Bethlehem uh, Bach Choir. And uh, so he's an expert on, on uh, uh, Sebastian uh, Bach, and he's going to uh, give us a uh the full scope of his life and career and uh uh it should be very interesting so tune in <laughs> okay well thanks again beth and jason for that wonderful thank you guys. presentation Thank you very much you. Thank, thank you, you for that